Need link building or content? Go to fatjoe.com. On demand marketing services for agencies and teams. Fat Joe. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Mo Cangela and I'm here to talk to you about the power of being different. So I'm going to talk to you about not just the power of being different, but why inclusion matters to everyone and why we founded Watch This Space and the work that we do. So I'm one of the co-creators of Watch This Space. We're a diversity and inclusion company based in Brighton and we work nationally and now internationally as well since we founded the company. So, if you haven't read up this book, it's called Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed. And in it, he says, if we are intent upon answering our most serious questions, from climate change to poverty and curing diseases to designing new products, we need to work with people who think differently, not just accurately. And another favourite of mine, Audrey Lord, who is a writer and activist, said, it's not our differences that divide us, it's our inability to recognise, accept and celebrate those differences. And that's what this talk is about. And we're all different in so many ways. In this room, we're all very different. In the Brighton Centre, you know, around the world, we're all really different in so many different ways. And if we break that down a little bit in terms of gender, just over 50% of us in the UK identify as female, so around 49% as male. And so one in every 250 identify as non-binary, so that's one aspect of difference. If we use 2011 census data, we don't yet have the results of the census we all filled in last year, we'll hopefully get that soon. But using that data, 86% of the population are white. And by 2031, minority ethnic groups are estimated to be around 15% of the population. And again, that's up from 12% two, from in 2011. And that's going to continue to increase and change. We're going to continue to have a more and more diverse population. 22% of people are registered with disabilities. That's 2020 data. And there are so many people with hidden disabilities that they may choose or not choose to disclose. These can be visual impairments, hearing impairments, neurodiversity, you know, many different aspects that make us all different. And we may choose to share them, but we might not. But they are all different ways in which we're different. And there's many other ways in which we're different too. So at Watch This Space, we do lots of workshops with companies to discover and understand differences in people and the vision they have for the future. And from that work, we've... Um, captures some of the things that come out from the work we do and these are some of the things that people say so they say their age makes them different to the people they work with their experiences their perspective things like politics morality where you live where you grew up socioeconomics you know all of these things are things that make us all different as people and we need to think about all these things and understand these things because that, that's the makeup of who we all are. And all of these things affect how we see the world and live differently because we're not all going to live life the same when we've got all these different perspectives and different ways of being. So why are we conditioned, if that's the case, to value sameness? Why is that the thing that's held up as the thing that we should value? And if we look at that, what do we mean by that? Well, when we look at who's in positions of power, who are those people? If you think about who you see around you in positions of power, who are they usually? And I've got some stats to back some of that up. So this is UK data. 90% of FTSE 100 CEO roles, 80% of venture capital funding for new businesses, 15% of higher salaries, so the gender pay gap that you may see reported, go to the same demographic. In the digital sector, fewer than 40% of roles are held by women. And 88% of employees in the digital sector are from white ethnicity. These are just some of the stats I've picked out. I could have picked lots of others, but these are the ones that illustrate that actually the value is placed on sameness and not on difference. And the world's designed around certain types of people who dominate everything. If we want to think about that more widely, if we think about extroverts and introverts, pretty much everything in our lives is designed around being an extrovert right from when you're at school. You've got to put your hand up to get attention. It's based around those dominant kind of features, dominant groups. 
And that, that means that those most likely to succeed are also from dominant groups because everything's designed around that, everything's geared towards that. So that's what happens. People start, start to do better, essentially, in life because they're the people that are valued. We've valued that sameness of those dominant groups. And some stats around that again. So in a typical large company, decisions are made 38% of the time by all male teams. And those are decisions around all kinds of things. So they could be decisions around how the company's organized, but it could be also around products, services, all kinds of things. And if you look at leadership, globally, 5% of global 500 CEOs are female. And there are no women of color in FTSE 100 CEO roles. That makes me really sad that there aren't any. And if women do succeed and get into leadership positions, when you look at the media coverage, it's about their shoes or something about how they look. It's not about the work that they're doing and the things that they're achieving and their values as leaders. And media messages promote these kind of gendered roles everywhere you look, it's all around us. So I took a look at film characters, Hollywood film characters. So out of 30,000 Hollywood film characters, 73.1% of them are from white ethnicity. And you can see the other stats there. So 12.5% black, 5.3% Asian, 4.9% Hispanic, and 4.2% from other ethnicities. So the global majority are not being represented. What's being represented is that sameness. And this is just one aspect of it, and a lot of these things intersect. But you get the idea of what I'm talking about here. It's all around us. And if we think about advertising messages around us and what we see, well, men are 1.3 times more likely than women to be shown working. 1.6 times more likely to be shown in the office. Ethnic minorities are two times less likely than white characters to be shown as the member of a family. In ads, 90% of ads do not include people of lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Think about, you know, advertising you see for breakfast cereals or anything that, around your life and think about what kind of homes are shown in that advertising. What are those messages that are around you? They're kind of valuing that sameness again, aren't they? And it all impacts how people are treated in workplaces because these are the messages around everybody. So this is what's being valued and how people are being treated. So we can look at lots of stats around this. I picked out a couple. Women are spoken over 50% of the time. They're interrupted all the time. It actually gets worse in video meetings. There's some interesting stats from Zoom around this. It got worse. They're interrupted even more in video meetings. If women negotiate, if they negotiate a higher salary, they're viewed negatively. Isn't she bossy? Isn't she aggressive? Not isn't she great? She's negotiated something good for herself. It's done negatively. You may have had some of those things said to you in your own workplace. I see some nods around the room. <laughs> and we're often unaware of our own biases in this. People often are. Because if you think about all the messages around you, you are faced with 11 million pieces of information at any given moment. Just pause on that for a second. 11 million. Your brain can process 40 out of that 11 million. So that's a lot of messages, a lot of things going on there for your brain to try and process. And so 95% of people are affected by unconscious bias when they're making decisions about other people. And I question the 5% that said they're not affected by that. I wonder if they really are. <laughs> because those biases essentially are shortcuts that your brain makes, uses to make those quick decisions. So they rely on stereotypes, assumptions, pattern recognition, and similarity. Because your brain is trying to process all this information, and so it's using these shortcuts to say, okay, those people are like that, and these people are like this, and this situation's like that, to help your brain to get to decisions. And so it's using assumptions. And so everybody's brain is trying to process all this information, and relying on some of this pattern recognition and assumptions to do that. But actually the real power is in being different and us understanding how to understand those differences and how to not value sameness all the time. 
<clears throat> and it starts when we're young. So, right from when we're at school, it starts with the messages around us. It starts with the things we read, the things we learn, the things we're told. It's all around us. All of those advertising messages are around too from when we're very young. And as workplaces have developed, they valued sameness over and over again in how things are done and how companies are run and who runs them and who makes the decisions. It's all about valuing those things. It's all around us. And if you're different, what does that mean? Well, lots of you may have experienced this. It means you have to adapt. You have to decide how you're going to adapt for a start, but you've got to adapt in some way to survive in the workplace. So a lot of people code switch. They have a person they are out of work and a person that they are in work. They pretend to be someone else in order to succeed because what's valued is sameness. They're often placed at disadvantages for being different. Oh, that's a funny name. How do I say that? Those kinds of things are said to people all the time. Those kinds of microaggressions. I've used that one because it's one I've experienced like throughout my working life. How do I say that? Uh, well, say what you see. Try saying it. Can I, can I call you Maury? No, that's not my name. <laughs> You know, those kinds of things get said to people all the time. And if they're said to you every day in everything you do, they can really wear you down because you're not being valued for who you are. And then that means barriers to achievement and opportunity because, you know, if you're having those things said to you all the time, you're feeling tired a lot of the time because you're constantly in a battle of trying to battle against this desire for sameness. Some people do thrive in those environments, though. So I'm going to just pause on that for a second, because there are some people that really thrive on being different and have been able to build really successful careers in doing that. But that takes a lot of confidence, and a lot of people don't feel they can do that. And certainly, you know, when I worked in corporate, when you're really in the minority, it takes a lot of courage to try and be different and relish being different and stand out. And that's hard for people. It's a really tough thing to do. And so it's a real challenge for people to try and do that. So if we think about our working lives, if you all think about your own working lives, how can we start treating people as individuals and valuing difference instead of valuing sameness? There are going to be challenges in that. I've got to be honest with you. We're not going to agree with each other because we're all coming from different perspectives and we need to learn how to disagree with each other and think about how we're gonna do that because you may have been that person in a meeting who has a different opinion and it takes some guts to say, I don't agree, I've got a different opinion, how about this? So we need to learn how to disagree with each other to be able to do that. But the benefits if we can do that are clear. So there's stats around this. Um, there's lots of research around this that you can read up on, lots of stats, research, government funded, all kinds of things. But essentially, there's 19% higher output of innovation from diverse teams. Decisions are made 87% better, faster decisions too, with about half the number of meetings. Yeah, people usually like that one. <laughs> and people feel more like they can belong. They're around 50% less likely to leave. And if we translate to that to some productivity, Happy people are 13% more productive. And if we think about salespeople, I was in a commercial role myself for many years. If you're a happy salesperson, you're 37% more likely to sell because you're exuding that happiness. You're confident in what you're selling. You feel you can belong to that company. So there are business benefits too to all of this, but that doesn't just happen. These things don't just happen. And we need to be brave about the challenges because we can't just say, oh, great, there's lots of innovation from diverse teams. Brilliant, let's tick a box. That's not how it's going to happen. People need to feel safe to share different ideas, to have a different opinion, and all of those things. So what we've got to do is tackle the difficult issues. We need to have the difficult conversations. We need to understand what our differences are. We need to understand what people don't agree on. And we need to fight the injustices when we see them. We really need to stand up and say, this isn't right. I'm going to do something about this. Because if we don't do that, we're not fighting for that better tomorrow. And this will all create impact on workplaces and working lives if we can do that. But we really have to work on this. So I'm going to talk about allyship. So people in places where allyship is encouraged are twice as likely to feel that they can belong. So just think about that for a second, twice as likely. So it's a pretty strong stat there. More than 80% of white employees see themselves as allies to people of colour at work. 
Remember that fact, 80%. When women of colour were asked, only 45% of them agree that they have strong allies in the workplace. <laughs> so we need to be honest too. <laughs> Thinking you're an ally, you know, posting some black squares on Instagram isn't actually driving change. What are you actually doing? Are you actually an ally? So if you want to be an active ally, you need to do the work. You need to encourage people to share differences and feel they can belong, but you also need to fight injustices. You need to stand alongside people. If you see things, you need to call it out. You need to challenge, you know, who isn't in this room? Who isn't here making those decisions? Because that's what being an ally is about. It's not just saying nice things and posting nice things on social media. It's being really active to be an ally. So some tips. What you can do to get started is look at all of your communications internal comms, external comms, everything you do, and get feedback from people who are different to you. Ask them what they think and understand how you can make your communications more inclusive. That's a great place to start. And when we work with companies, it's one of the first things we get them to do is to have a look at all of their communications. Think about how you work and how you can enable people who are different to have a voice and feel they can belong. So are you making decisions, for example, in meetings? They're often the worst places to make a decision about something and get inputs from people. They suit certain types of people. Some people will never tell you what they think in a meeting. If you really want to get lots of good ideas and different inputs from people, how are you going to do that? Are you going to have online ways for people to do that, anonymous ways, speak to people one-to-one? -one? You need to really break that down and not just expect it to happen because those lovely stats about innovation and ideas don't just happen. People need to feel safe to share different ideas and be able to do that. And with those different perspectives, if we can do that, then back to that quote at the beginning, we can create products, solutions, and services to solve the world's problems because we're using collective ideas in this, not just some people's perspectives. And solving problems for those who are different actually helps everyone. I'm going to use the example of accessible websites. Accessible websites and things like captions on videos are great for people that have visual impairments. That's what they need to be able to access those things. But it actually creates a better experience for everyone else. And it's the same with buildings, and it's the same with enabling different people to be heard and enabling different people to achieve leadership positions. Those things help everyone. Those things help create a better world for everyone. Because it's not good for all of us if the same type of people are making decisions about everything. We want to enable those differences to be heard. Because there is true power in being different. We just have to unlock it and stop valuing sameness all the time and that being the thing that we value and the thing that's always in, in people's minds. So some things to think about. I'm going to leave you with a few things to think about. We are all different, but for some of us, our differences can disadvantage us more than others and we have to accept that. And we have to understand that for some people, they really have to code switch or hide what they think or don't feel they can speak up. And so we need to really think about how we're going to enable people to feel they can say what they think. If we can do that, those differences can be superpowers if we work on including those different perspectives and ideas. But we've got to do the work to do that, that stat about allyship. We've got to actually acknowledge, are you being an ally or not? Are you letting things go? That comment that somebody said, what did you do about it? That person you heard, you know things about them that they've done to somebody else. Are you still amplifying them? Are you still following them and supporting them? Because if you are, you're not an ally. And so we need to think about that. And inclusive ways of working and communicating are actually here to help everyone because it creates a fairer world one where everybody can achieve the things they want to and where we're not always valuing sameness. And so, as I draw to a close, I've got a quote from one of my favourite writers, Maya Angelou, who says, if you're always trying to be normal, you'll never know how amazing you can be. So if you want to find out more about what we do at Watch This Space, we're a diversity and inclusion company. We work with all kinds of organisations on how to really bring about those kinds of cultures that value difference and not sameness. So you'll find us on um, our website there and on social media, we're at Watch This, Watch this SPCE, and a few of us are around here today if you have questions. Thank you.
Need link building or content? Go to fatjoe.com. On-demand marketing services for agencies and teams. Fat Joe.